What happens if you force two branches with different requirements to use the same aircraft? Only one will get the plane they wanted, the other gets nothing. This is in a nutshell the story and history of the F-111. In 1961, both United States Air Force and Navy were both seeking a new aircraft. With his background in the automotive industry, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara noticed that both services had common stipulations in their request. Both services asked for a dual-seat, twin-engine aircraft capable of carrying heavy armament and fuel with a variable geometry wing. Both services using the same aircraft could provide cost savings, hence McNamara ordered the go-ahead of the Tactical Fighter Experimental TFX program, forcing both services, against their wishes, to share a common aircraft. Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed, McDonnell, North American, and Republic submitted proposals with General Dynamics winning the TFX contract in December 1962. If you like this kind of videos, you can help out the channel by subscribing and by liking the video. If you have suggestions for other aircraft, you can leave them in the comments. Although outwardly both Navy and Air Force aircraft might look the same, the mission requirements were different. The Air Force wanted a fighter bomber capable of deep strike and interdiction missions. The Navy, on the other hand, required a long-range interceptor aircraft to protect its carrier battle group equipped with a more powerful radar and longer-ranged missiles than its current interceptor, the F-4 Phantom. Forced to cooperate by McNamara, both services could only agree on a swing-wing, two-seat, twin-engine aircraft. The Air Force wanted a tandem seat, while the Navy demanded a side-by-side -side seating so that pilot and radar operator could share the radar display. When General Dynamics won the TFX program, it was decided that the Air Force would receive the A model while the B model of the F-111 was intended for the Navy. The F-111 was designed as an all-weather attack aircraft, capable of low-level penetration of enemy defenses, since Soviet surface-to-air missiles were capable of shooting high-flying planes out of the sky. The most visible feature of the F-111 is its variable geometry wings, allowing the aircraft to sweep its wings at the optimum angle depending on its speed. Another special feature of the F-111 was its escape capsule. Instead of two ejection seats, which would eject pilot and radar operator separately, the entire cockpit was ejected in case of an emergency. The F-111 had an internal weapons bay which could carry bombs, a removable 20mm M61 cannon or auxiliary fuel tanks. The F-111B model would have carried two aimed 54 Phoenix missiles in the bay. The F-111C and F model carried a targeting system in the weapons bay instead of bombs. This targeting system allowed the F-111 to drop laser-guided bombs which were carried on the underwing pylons. The F-111 had four underwing pylons with the inner two pylons capable of rotating to align with the fuselage. The two outer pylons were fixed. There were no weapon pylons on the fuselage, but the F-111 had two underside stations for electronic countermeasures pods or data link pods. Some F-111 were also fitted with shoulder rails on the inner swiveling pylons capable of carrying AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles for self-defense. The Air Force received its first F-111 in 1967. The F-111 would serve until 1996 when they were replaced by the F-15E Strike Eagle. An important reason for ending its deployment was the high cost to operate the F-111. Tactical Air Command once claimed that the F-111 represented 9% of the fleet but cost 25% of the maintenance budget. The other operator was the Australian Air Force, which fielded the F-111C model up until 2010. The Australian Air Force replaced them ad interim with Super Hornets until the delivery of the F-35 Lightning II. There could have been two more operators on the list. Lacking experience with carrier-based aircraft, General Dynamics called in the help of Grumman. With a troubled development and changing requirements, development of the carrier variant was halted. In the end, Grumman would deliver the aircraft the Navy needed, the F-14 Tomcat. Another missed operator was the Royal Air Force. 
The British government halted the development of the back TSR-2 strike aircraft, citing the lower costs of the F-111. However, as costs increased, the government decided to cancel the order for what would have been a fleet of 50 F-111K variants. In 1968, six F-111s were deployed to Vietnam. These aircraft carried 55 night missions out in the skies above North Vietnam. During this deployment, three aircraft were lost. Two wreckages could not be recovered, however the third crashed F-111 revealed a weakness in the hydraulic system used to operate the horizontal stabilizer. As this weakness was discovered in 42 other F-111s, suspicion rose that the first two crashed F-111 were caused by the same failure and not by enemy fire. Nevertheless, this halted temporarily combat operations in Vietnam. In September 1972, F-111s returned to Vietnam to participate in Operation Linebacker. The F-111 showed its worth in Vietnam as it could attack targets in weather which grounded other aircraft, nor did the F-111s need tanker or electronic countermeasures support. F-111s would end the war with 4,000 missions flown with only six combat losses. In 1986, 18 F-111s conducted airstrikes against Libya as part of the Operation El Dorado Canyon. Only one F-111 was lost, probably due to enemy fire. The final combat operations for the F-111 happened during Operation Desert Storm in 1991. F-111s were responsible for dropping 80% of the war's laser-guided bombs and were credited with destroying more than 1,500 Iraqi tanks and armored vehicles, which was described as tank plinking. A highly capable, yet expensive-to-operate aircraft, the F-111 proved itself in the skies above Vietnam, Libya, and Iraq. However, the most important lesson one might learn from this aircraft is that sometimes it is better to let each branch develop its own aircraft instead of wasting taxpayers' money on trying to find a common aircraft which ends up being a jack-of-all-trades, but specialist of none. Something one might fear of the three F-35 variants entering in service. In future episodes, I will delve into more detail for every separate F-111 model, but in the meantime, thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.